On today's episode, I'm talking all about the best food to feed your dog. I'm then moving on to two neutered dogs who keep humping each other. So how can we stop that? And also how your dog can catch leptospirosis so you know whether they need to be vaccinated or not. But first, here's the intro. You're listening to the Dr. Alex Answers Podcast, the show that answers all of your dog and cat health questions so they can live healthier, happier lives. And here's your host, veterinarian, Dr. Alex Avery. Hi, and welcome to episode number 20 of the Dr. Alex Answers Show. I'm Dr. Alex, and I've been a veterinarian since 2006, working on the front line of pet health care. This led me to create ourpetshealth.com and launch this podcast, where my overriding hope is that I'm able to help you and your pet to live a healthier, happier life. Thanks for tuning in. And if you're not already and you enjoy this episode, then make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss out on any of the future weekly shows. But for now, let's jump into the first question. And my first question is from Yeliz, who writes, Good afternoon. I'd like to offer my Shih Tzu the best food I can. Which one would you recommend? Well, let's start off by saying that the best food to feed a dog is a very simple question, but it's a massive question as well. And I guess the simple answer is that I recommend feeding a high quality, complete commercial cooked diet. But how do you go about knowing whether the diet you're thinking of falls into that category? Well, the first thing to say is, is the balance but is the diet complete and balanced? So it should have that written on the pack. Um, That is a a, a kind of protected term. So you could only pop that on if it is complete and balanced. And that means that it's a diet that can be fed by itself and it's going to meet all of your dog's requirements. The next thing to say is how do we know that it's complete and balanced? So we can get various different ways that diets are tested. So they can be tested using the AAFCO feeding trials or by formulating to meet the nutrient profiles, either by formulation or by testing of the finished product. You know, and really the best thing is going to be that they're going to be tested by feeding trials. If not that, then actually testing of the finished product. And then I guess the worst way that we can say that they're balanced is by um, meeting the nutrient profiles or formulated to meet the nutrient profiles. And the reason for that is that when we formulate diets, when we kind of cook and prepare and, and, and manufacture diets, it might be that there are changes made to the diet in that manufacturing process that mean the finished product is different from the the nutrient profiles that went into form. Format. And then the next question we want to ask when we're trying to find the best diet to feed a dog is can the manufacturers provide an average or a typical nutrient analysis rather than just guarantee guaranteeing a minimum analysis. Now a minimum analysis means that that might be very different from what the dog food is actually providing. It's going to be the minimum levels but the the actual realistic levels might be very very different. So that suggests that actually the diet is really variable in how it's manufactured the ingredients that go into it and and the the levels of those ingredients changes with time and so what's in one bag isn't going to be in another and they're just guaranteeing the minimum analysis really what you want is them to provide an average or a typical nutrient analysis because you know that then that formulation is much more stable and that from one bag to the next there's going to be very little if any differences in them now the next thing that we naturally look at are ingredients now ingredients are listed in descending order order by weight and really the high water content in in chicken and beef and lamb and other meats makes these ingredients weigh more than dry ingredients like grains and meals and vitamins and so really the meats are often listed first and they really should be listed first because if they're not then it's likely that there was little meat um, or a lot of different mixed meat sources that have gone into that diet you know Also, we need to be aware that different forms of the same ingredient may actually be split out. And so it might be made to look less or they might the diets might look like they contain less of these ingredients than they actually do. So examples here would be that wheat germ meal, wheat bran and wheat flour clearly all come from wheat. But by splitting it into those three different groups, it might be that they can go much lower down in the list of ingredients. Now, that all said, really the main benefit of looking at ingredients is if you know that your dog has an allergy or an intolerance to a specific ingredient. In a lot of cases, there's a lot of different kind of words on that ingredient list that it's quite difficult to know exactly what they all mean without having a big long kind of encyclopedia in front of you so you can refer to to, to those so that you know exactly what they mean. But really the main benefit of looking at ingredients is knowing if your dog has an allergy or intolerance to a specific part of a diet. The next question we want to ask is we want to be choosing a diet that's 
right for that life stage and size of your dog. So have you got a small breed dog or a large breed dog? That's important because for large breed dogs and especially if they're puppies and as they're growing, we don't want them to grow too quickly because that can cause joint problems. So we want to feed for the size of the adult dog. Also, we you know, is your dog a puppy? Are they an adult? Are they a senior? Are they neutered? Are they active? Are they working? Because these are going to have different requirements. These dogs are going to have different requirements based on their life stage and based on their activity levels so that they're growing appropriately, they're maintaining their body weight, they're maintaining their muscle mass, um, and, you know, maybe their organs are supported as well as they can be, certainly in senior animals. We also need to then understand that some of the words written on packs are nothing more than marketing and a lot of pet food comes down to marketing. Terms like natural, holistic, hypoallergenic, premium, human grade are not protected terms. They don't mean anything. There's no proof of what goes in there that manufacturers have to provide to be able to use those terms. You know, it might be that that changes in the future, but at this stage, really, they're just marketing nonsense. So don't pay too much attention to those. And then when it comes to feeding your dog and the best food to feed your dog, we don't necessarily just want to feed one food. So you want to maybe feed a variety of different flavours, different formulations, so different types of wet food that come as as chunks, as broths, as mousses, that kind of thing. And then kibble, so different biscuit size, different shape. And this means that if you do need in the future to switch to a specific diet, you know, later on in life, because your dog's got a, a specific condition, so for example, kidney disease, then they're much more likely to accept a different flavour or a different diet type and a different formulation. Now, you can absolutely add in some cooked meats some vegetables, um, you know, other things for variety. That's absolutely fine. And really with treats of any kind and additions for any kind, you know, really they should only make up less than about 10% of a dog's calorie intake. So that's very important because it's very easy to overfeed. And certainly with when it comes to treats, if we're giving things like cheese um, or chips or that kind of thing, they're really fatty, they're really energy dense, and they just make the, the problem of obesity and being overweight much more likely. So, if you're interested in um, different treats that you can feed your dog then check out episode number 16 where I discuss this in much more detail and then finally as I've already touched on if your dog does have a disease that would benefit from a specific diet and that could be skin disease it could be diabetes it could be kidney disease there's a whole load then really that should be the main guide in the best diet to feed that individual dog and that is something that you should absolutely be discussing with your veterinarian because they will know you know what the best options are and which one is most appropriate from your dog and can kind of talk to you about why that diet is important to be fed but The final thing I'd like to say on the topic of the best diet to feed a dog is that I'd actually argue that the biggest consideration with feeding your dog rather than the specific diet is actually making sure that you're feeding the right amount. So obesity is a massive problem. It's we're in the middle of an obesity epidemic in ourselves and our pet dogs and cats with well over 50% of dogs being overweight. So that's a huge problem. It can knock years off a dog's life. Um, It's been shown to shorten life expectancy by as much as two years. So that's a huge percentage of a dog's life. And it also causes diabetes. It causes arthritis, which can be absolutely crippling. So it has a massive impact on a dog's quality of life as well. So as well as, you know, feeding a good quality, a high quality diet, to your dog you also want to make sure that you're feeding the right amount so that they can be as healthy and as happy as possible and then before we jump into the next question I just wanted to let you know that if you're interested in learning more about feeding your dog you should really check out my free ebook looking at the pros and cons of both raw diets as well as kibble just to help you make a fully informed decision about what is the best diet to feed your dog both for their health as well as the health of your family you can download your free copy today just by heading to rpetshealth.com slash raw diet guide you're listening to the Dr. Alex Answers Show Question number two comes from David, and David writes that his daughter has a a neutered brother of Guinness, his dog, and when they play, they constantly take turns humping each other. It seemed to start after neutering, which is around six months for for Guinness and eight months for his brother, and they spend hours together several times a week. We can control it in the house, but outside it is constant. They don't get together with other dogs so that's not a problem and David's wife is thinking of getting a training collar what are my suggestions so we think of humping as a completely sexual activity but actually that's not always the case and certainly in a neuter dog the hormone levels are going to be very low and the sexual drive is going to be very low or non-existent and you know 
the dog is still humping because it's also carried out in a number of different um, different situations. So humping is also a dominance activity. It can also be a displacement activity with a dog humping when it's feeling a certain emotion. And the typical ones here would be stress, um, anxiety or excitement. And perhaps excitement is the, the more likely one in David's dog's case. Um, as well as being a play behavior as well. And if it's not bothering either dog, then, you know, it can also be um, a learned behavior. So, you know, did you start off finding it funny and making a fuss of the dog? And so they've now both learned that actually they don't mind it. And if they repeat it, then it gets your attention. So humping can also be a learned behavior. Now, if you know, not necessarily in this case, but if you've got an older dog who you castrate, then, you know, because they've been humping things and they've spent a lot of time that, you know, they've been sexually active as well, then again, that can become a learned behaviour. So they've learned to do that. They've done that regularly and removing the hormones doesn't stop it um, or doesn't stop it completely. So there's a number of things that we can do here. Now, the first is to try and remove yourself from the scene or ignore them, because if they've learned that they get your attention then and, and you give it to them, then it's just going to perpetuate the problem. You can try and distract them from each other so um, that the introduction is more low key. Uh, you know, try and make sure that they're tired out before seeing each other. If it's only happening outside, can you let one dog out at a time? You know, or, or you know, it's a bit harder if they're not being supervised and they've got access through um, a dog flap or something like that. Now, you can also start training your dog to come with called um, and then when they're exhibiting the behavior that you don't want so in this case the humping you can call them away to stop that from developing and then another option is to put the dogs in time out as soon as they start humping and the the thought here is that they'll learn that actually that humping behavior causes all the fun to stop and it's not something that they should continue now the final part of the question was that um, David's wife is thinking of getting a training collar and by this I presume you mean kind of an electric collar or a shock collar now Training collars are very easy to use incorrectly. And the result of this can mean that it either ends up reinforcing the behavior or leaving a dog just really stressed and scared without knowing without having a clue why it's being punished. They're really not something that I would recommend at all. Now, if you're not getting anywhere with some of these other suggestions, then the best thing to do is going to be enlist some, to enlist some professional help, um, be that a dog trainer or a behaviorist, just to give you the best chance of stopping your dog humping and getting this pro problem behavior nipped in the bud. And then just remember that the information I give in these podcast episodes is not a substitute for a consultation and examination with your pet's veterinarian and should not be taken as specific advice for any individual pet. If your pet is unwell, if they're injured or if they're suffering from any kind of problem, then talking to your vet is always going to be the best course of action. Get your question answered at dralexanswers.com. And then the final question in today's episode is from Jean, who writes that she's read that all the information on leptospirosis um, that she's come across um, has been interesting, but she was wondering if um, I can tell her how it's contracted. So is it ingested? Is it airborne? Is it transmitted through the skin? You know, what's the deal here? What makes her dog more at risk? So, you know, how do dogs get leptospirosis is the bottom line here. Now, leptospirosis, it's caused by an infection with the bacteria leptospira, and there are actually several different variations which are also known as serovars and the presence of these is, really varies depending on where in the world you are so your geographical location now dogs are the primary host of the leptospira bacteria but many other mammals can be infected and it's been shown that leptospirosis can develop in over 150 different species you know and that's only the ones that have been reported so that includes farm animals um, wild animals rodents and also humans which is clearly important here so this disease so leptospirosis is zoonotic which means that it can be transmitted from animals to us. So if your dog has leptospirosis, then we need to be really careful with how we're hospitalizing them, how we're treating them, how we're managing them at home. But it also gives an added impetus to protecting them from developing that infection in the first place, because that will prevent us or reduce the risk of us also contracting leptospirosis. Now, what happens is the bacteria, they infect the kidneys, um, they multiply within the kidneys and, and then a shed in the urine. So that's where the main kind of contamination comes from in an infected animal's urine. Now dogs are infected just by coming into contact with either the infected urine or urine contaminated soil, water, food or bedding. And what happens is the leptospira bacteria cross the mucous membrane, so like the gums, 
Um, or they can be transmitted actually directly across the skin if there are wounds or small abrasions present, which there are hi- very likely to be in a dog's feet. Um, so if they're walking through some contaminated water or contaminated soil, then the chances are that you know they're going to have small cuts, small little nicks, small little br- abrasions in their skin, and there's the potential for that transmission of disease there. Now, the bacteria, it doesn't replicate outside the body, so it's just going to sit there. It's not going to spread um, to areas where animals haven't urinated, but the Leptospira bacteria can remain in an infectious state in the soil or in water for many, many months. And that's, again, going to depend a little bit on the environment and on the location and where you are in the world, because the bacteria can be killed by freezing or by exposure to UV. So if you're a very, very cold area then and it's you know winter, then the leptospira is going to be completely killed and winter's not going to be a risk. If you live in a very sunny spot, then, you know, certainly in sunny areas where the sun is actually shining down and the UV rays are on the soil, then that's going to help with the breakdown. Clearly, kind of deeper down in the soil or if there are shady patches, then it still might be a risk. But, you know, potentially there's going to be less of a risk in these kind of particular areas. And then the risk of a dog contracting leptospirosis is also going to depend on their lifestyle and the local presence of leptospirosis. So it's a disease that's most common in dogs that drink from rivers, lakes and streams. So they're the ones that are likely to get contaminated. Um, Also rural dogs that are allowed to roam dogs that have access to sewage so you know depends on the sewerage system in your area but also suburban or urban dogs with an infected local urban population of wildlife so that would be like rats um, and mice you know maybe foxes um, squirrels depending on where you are in the world now what can we do about trying to stop this infection if your dog is living in a higher risk area well we want to avoid these high risk areas if at all possible but really that's very hard because short of moving to a new area and likely a new country that's really not going to be too easy vaccination is the best option when it's felt that there is a risk of a dog catching leptospirosis like i say we're protecting not just the dog but we're also protecting ourselves from infection as well vaccination is very effective at preventing infection it lasts for at least 12 months. So unfortunately, it's not one of these vaccines that can be given every three years or so. It should be given every 12 months. But really, the risk of leptospirosis in your area and the vaccination options should be discussed with your vet. And so that's it for this episode of the podcast. But before I sign off, I just wanted to read you this review of the show from Bob, who writes, all my questions answered. I love this show. I'm not a pet nut or anything, but I do like to stay informed. And it's great to be able to ask my questions to a vet and not have to fork out cash to have them answered. The answers are always so thoughtful too. I love Alex's style. So easygoing, but professional as well. So really appreciate those words, Bob. You know, it makes all of the work worthwhile when I get feedback like this. And if you have a couple of minutes, I'd also love it if you could leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or over at rpetshealth.com slash review, just to help more people discover this podcast and allow me to help more pets. Remember as well to subscribe. And until next week's episode, take care. You've been listening to the Dr. Alex Answers Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode of the show where you ask the questions and Dr. Alex answers.